option on Zoom, uh, which will kind of give me an idea about the order in which people would want to go uh, you know, and speak. Um, so please utilize that. Um, so in the first 40 minutes, uh, hopefully Professor Subhashkar will be able to join within this time. Uh, we'll be having the interventions by our expert speakers who have been invited for this event, uh, subsequently followed by an open flow where we'll be having discussions in a more you know, broad, broad manner of sorts. So uh, let us begin. <clears throat> right. Um, or the five elements based on their subtlety as seen in the Narayana of Vishal, um, in the Atharvaveda. In the second Mundaka of the, and the first Khand of the Mundaka Upanishad, we see the ordering of these elements in the words, Khamam Bayur Jyotir Apa Prithvi Vishvasya Dharini. The modern idea of vacuity in Akash, denoting the skies of space, is arguably misplaced. This is the vacuity that has as its descriptor sound or subtle perturbations, which qualifies it. The word in Sanskrit is derived from a root, kash, which means to be. And in classical Sanskrit, the noun acquires a neuter gender and may express the concept of an expansive atmosphere as seen in the Shatpad Brahman. In Vedantic philosophy, the word acquires its technical meaning of a ubiquitous fluidic entity imagined as pervading the cosmos. In today's world, we know that the basis of perturbation and empirical particles emerging thereof can be attributed to the quantum vacua, which are distinct for the different quantum fields as per the field theory. A natural question arises as to whether one can and should even try to equate these contemporary and ancient formulations in a rigorous manner, and if there are any avenues where the emergence of Akasha can be seen without recourse to pseudoscience. To discuss this and more, we bring to you in this Mandala Beta, a group discussion, uh, as part of Mandala uh, wing of Vigyan and Bharati. Um, we will begin the event with interventions from a panel of esteemed speakers. So without further ado, let me introduce them to you. We have with us Professor Shishi Roy, who is a visiting professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies and has been awarded the prestigious Senior Homi Bhava Fellow, Fellowship by the Homi Bhava Fellowships Council in Mumbai. Uh, he has published more than 250 journal papers and 16 monographs, including the one which is very relevant to this discussion today and event, uh, which is Demystifying the Akasha with Ralph Ibrahim and Understanding Space, Time and Causality, Modern Physics and Ancient Indian Wisdom with B.V. Shrikantan. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Good evening. Uh, yes. uh, we also have Dr. J Can I please request uh, the attendants, uh, uh, the attendees, sorry, um, to please mute themselves if they are not speaking at the moment. I actually, right now, if everyone could mute themselves, please, um, so that we don't have disturbance during the event. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we also have Dr. Rama Jayasundar, uh, who is a professor and head of the department of NMR uh, at the at Ames, Delhi. Um, Dr. Rama Jayasundar has a PhD from the University of Cambridge, UK and she's trained in physics and nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR. She holds a professional BAMS or the Bachelor of Ayurvedic Medicine and Surgery degree in Ayurveda and has this unique academic con combination of being uh, an MR physicist and a professionally trained Ayurvedic doctor. As an MR physicist with specialization in biomedical MR, uh, Dr. Rama Jarasundar has wide experience in experimental, clinical and high resolution MR systems. Uh, her current research interests harness her distinctive training in physics, experimental MR, Ayurveda, and modern medicine for innovative research in Ayurveda. We welcome you, uh, Dr. Rama Jasundar. Okay, okay. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Namaskar. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you. Uh, we, we, have, we also have Professor K. Rama Subramanyam, uh, who is Institute Chair Professor at the Cell for Indian Science and Technology in Sanskrit, or CISTS, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Bombay. Uh, he's a world-class scholar of great repute, a historian of Indian sciences and mathematics and astronomy, a Sanskrit guru, a Vedic teacher, and an Indian philosopher. His immensely broad erudition, his insights, and popular teachings have been inspiring a new generation of thousands of students, scholars, and teachers to learn and undertake research on the riches of India's scientific heritage and enabling its preservation. His creating and exciting uh, teachings at creative and uh, exciting teachings at IIT Bombay and his unique unparalleled multidisciplinary scholarship uh, continues to make an impact with the powerful combination of science, Sanskrit, and spirituality. His life's mission, as he puts it, has been to inspire society to undertake research and give India its rightful place 
in the world of history of science and ignite interest in Sanskrit as a language of science. We welcome you, Professor Ramasubramaniam. Namaste. Thanks for the very kind introduction. Uh, and last but definitely not the least, we have we will be having hopefully uh, Professor Padmashri Professor Subhash Kak, uh, who is a Regents Professor of Computer Science at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater. Uh, born in Srinagar, Kashmir, he was educated at IIT Delhi. Uh, he coined the term quantum neural computing for the theory wherein neural networks do conscious and pre-conscious processing while certain virtual particles are the ground for the unconscious. He has previously worked on archaeoastronomy, history of science and art, and his work has been showcased in popular media, including Discovery and History Channels, and he has authored 20 books uh, in total. Uh, I, I don't think he has joined us at the moment, but uh, hopefully he'll be joining us soon. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to uh, begin with the introductory interventions by our speakers and would like to invite Professor Shishir Roy to begin the proceedings. Professor Roy. Yeah. Good evening, namaste. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to give a talk on this topic because I have published, as you mentioned, a book called Demystifying the Akasha, Quantum Vacuum and Consciousness, jointly with Ralph Abraham from USA. Now, let me uh, try to have PowerPoint. Yeah. So uh, the title of my today's talk is Demystifying the Akasho, Modern Physics and Ancient Indian Wisdom. And the lecture which I'm giving today is based on my book, Demystifying the Akasho, Consciousness and Quantum Vacuum. This lecture consists of two parts, one part regarding the five tattvas, and uh, the second part concerned the uh, akash tattva and what happens, what is the similarity or convergence or divergence with modern physics. So concept of akashu, as Dr. Mithunjai, he told already, I am quoting Swami Yogananda. He interpreted akashu in the following manner. The Sanskrit word akashu derives from a towards and kasho to be visible or to appear. So akasho is the subtle background against which everything in the material universe becomes perceptible. And the aka word akasho is translated in English as space or ether. However, the concept of ether as a medium of the propagation of light is not the appropriate one in Indian philosophy. The concept of akasho as the distinguishing quality of the sound in contrast to the ether as that of light. In fact, to understand the concept of akasho, one needs to understand the concept of tattva. So what is uh, mean by tattva? It signifies the essence which creates the feeling of existence. The word tattva means something that is elementary and primary, something that forms the basis of the rest of the development, the essence, the reality, and the real state of anything, the truth, the true principle. Therefore, the tattvas that the Upanishads describe are the elementary principles that govern this creation and the fundamental elements that act as the basic building blocks of this complex creation. Now, you know, all of you know that uh, there are pancha tattvas and tanmatras. So, tanmatras, the abstract quality from which tattvas are generated. Or yeah. So, akash tattva, bayu tattva, agni tattva, apos, and prithi. So, akash is perceived through shabda, panmatra, or called normally called sound. Bayu is perceived through sparsha tattva, sparsha tanmatra, called touch or feel. Agni is perceived through rupa tanmatra called form or vision, opposite is perceived through rasha tanmatra called taste, and prithi is perceived through gandha tanmatra or smell. Then, tattvas and their evolution. All the tattvas should be regarded as an extension of pure consciousness and not as individual entity existing separately. It should be remembered that in the course of evolution, 
Shatru states give rise to Grosha states, and each Grosha state has the preceding element as its cause. Thus, cause is the, as an essential part of the effect. Akastattva, which is the main uh, topic of today's discussion, which evolves from Akasha Dhanmatra, does not contain the qualities of other four tattvas, as they are grosha than it. Out of Akash evolves Bayu, which is made up of both Akash Tanmatra and Bayu Tanmatra. From Bayu arises the Tattva of Agni, which contains the Akasha, Bayu, and Agni Tanmatra. Agni later develops into Opus, which contains Akasha, Bayu, Agni, Opus Tanmatra. In the last Tattva, Prithi, the qualities of five Tattvas are combined. Now, the Ancha Tattvas, there is a definite ordering. I mean, uh, this ordering, you cannot make it haphazard way. Like from Akash, you have to go to Bayu like this way. So there is a definite ordering. And this ordering is very much important. And we need to de demystify this ordering, why it, how it be linked to the modern physics. In Akash Tattu, there is vibration or like fluctuations in, in very loose terminology. But the issue is how we can relate it to the modern physics. This already, this fluctuation or vibration, what we can do, we can relate with quantum fluctuation. But the quantum fluctuation is characterized by a fluctuation which is different from thermal fluctuation. And this is called conservative or non-dissipative fluctuation. This is very, very interesting aspect. That is something which does not dissipate. Now the question comes, how the other tattvas evolve? We don't know. Maybe uh, our traditional scholars, they can shed light that how we can relate or they can give insights how we can relate to other tattvas and the properties of matter like gross matter or subtle matter. Because if we consider the everyday object, which is called macroscopic object, and you are coming down to the lower and lower, means it's called top-down approach. So from bigger object, you are coming to smaller object, smaller to molecular level, to atomic level, to electrons, protons, quarks, etc., etc. But quantum fluctuations is there at every level. We don't know how we can relate it, the five tattvas to different aspects of matter in the modern physics. Now, we will focus on Akash tattva because this is uh, today's topic of discussion. There are three types of Akasha, Bhutakash, Chittakash, and Chidakash. So Bhutakash is the outer space, the physical space. Chittakash, space from where thoughts and emotion come, and Chidakash, space of consciousness. So Chittakash and Bhutakash, which are created out of Chidakash, are the cause of everything. And in Trika philosophy, in Kashmiri Shaivism, Shiva creates space and time. The spatial and material universe is created of five elements, four of matter, fire, earth, air, and water, and one of pure space or ether, or Akasha. Now, what are the challenges? Challenges is like, as I told you, we have two approaches, one from top down, another from bottom up. What is the bottom up? I mean, at the bottom level, there is very small scale uh, called Planck scale. What is Planck scale? At the level of Planck scale, I mean, the space is discrete. And below the Planck scale, there is no concept of space, time, and causality. Only there exists fluctuation. Vigorous fluctuation are there below the Planck scale. Now we come to above the Planck scale, which is the everyday 
object where it states like uh, strings, like elemental particles, then nanoscale, and we come to the macroscopic everyday object. So the issue is how we can construct a continuum space time out of this a substratum that, that is beyond the Planck scale, which is full of fluctuation. This indicates kind of similarity with the Akash Tattva. So this is the, like a challenge in 21st century physics that how from a substratum, which is full of fluctuations, without space, without time, you can construct a space which is continuum with uh, causality and other properties. So this, this is challenging issue is similar to how to consider the concept of Akasha, I mean Chidakash, and from Chidakash, how the whole creation emanates. Let us take some insights from our ancient wisdom. In 1889, a great Indian scholar, Ram Prasad, in his book, Nature's Finite Forces, he translated the word, I mean, uh, if you can, before that, let me uh, take you to Ishopanishad. There is mantra for in Ishopanishad, whose commentary has been written by Adi Shankaracharya, as well as some other people. The translation of this mantra for in Ishopanishad, it says, the Atman does not move, is one, is swifter than the mind, the sense reach it not, as it is the foremost in the motion, it goes beyond others in rapid motion while itself at rest. In, in it, the recorder preserves the action. So uh, Ram Prashad is a great scholar, traditional scholar. He interpreted this in a different from what Shankaracharya did it. There is a word in this uh, mantra called Matarishwa. So he interpreted this word Matarishwa as the decoder. Usually the word is translated as ear, but he translated the recorder in the following sense. The word Matarishwa consists of two words, Maturi and Shwars. Maturi ordinarily means mother, but he suggested it has space at the substratum of the distance. From the root means root ma to measure. So other word, swas is translated as a breather associated with the root sasu to breathe. Hence the compound word means, I mean matarishwar means he who breathes in space. So we are in a position to visualize that space with vibration. Also in Kashmiri Shaivism, the concept of spanda or vibration is introduced for creation also. Now, uh, let us go to the modern science, whether we can think of a space with vibration. Yes, in 1940, Carl Winger, the mathematician, he belongs to Vienna School of Positivism, and he was the assistant of great mathematician Brouwer. And he proposed a kind of geometry or kind of space called probabilistic or statistical space. Where space, in space, I mean, he, his starting point was from discreteness, how do you make continuum? So normally in mathematics, I mean, you can think of Akasho as the space, but space has different meanings in terms of the geometry or non-geometry in the following way. I mean, in topology, the space is defined as set of points and some kind of ordering. But all topological space doesn't have concept of distance functions or other properties which give such a geometry, like triangle inequality or uh, such kind of property. So all topological spaces are not metrizable, means that all types of space, you cannot think of distance function and other geometric properties. Carl Minger, he told that let us start with a set of points. 
set of disk. He told that normally people start with a set of points, then try to resolve the problem of continuity. This is a most challenging problem in math, pure mathematics. But he, his idea was different. He told, instead of that, let us start with a set of small lumps called fuzzy lumps. And the lump has the property that they can overlap with each other. So it gives such a continuity. So essentially what he introduced, he introduced kind of fluctuations or kind of probability in the geometry. Hence the name probabilistic geometry or statistical geometry. And uh, we have, I have already published a book on statistical geometry and applications to <coughs> microphysics and cosmology. Now, what is the relevance here? Relevance is that, I mean, Mithunja already told that many people thought that there is a similarity with quantum vacuum and Akasho. We said, no, this is a wrong notion because in usual understanding of quantum vacuum, there are a lot of fields. And for any kind of fields, you need a very well-defined concept of geometry, like Minkowskian geometry or something else. But in Akasho, I mean, Chidakasho, there is no concept of such kind of geometric structure. So uh, this quantum vacuum is completely different. Instead of that, let us start with a quantum vacuum, which does not have the concept of geometric structure. So how do you start? We started, I mean, in, in this book, we have uh, mentioned our published paper on, on this aspect and Mathematicians and physicists, like we tried to understand whether the geometric notion can be traced back to pre-geometric notion. Pre-geometric notions means we don't have notion of distance, we don't have notion of triangle inequality and other things. So how can you start from pre-geometric notion to geometric notion that is the physical space where the whole universe is embedded and uh, there are different properties. So what is pre-geometric notion? We started with a set of discrete points and a, their discrete points uh, it gives rise to kind of network. So this network is kind of probabilistic network. So starting from these discrete points and network, probabilistic network, we have shown it through a lot of simulation or agent-based simulation discovered by Boston University, that you can get a continuum. I mean, kind of low-range attractor occurs, means the points march together and we get a continuum. So our traditional wisdom, what Ishopanishad mantra for, they say that we can think Akasho is a kind of fluctuating space, which is a substratum of the distance. Here we have a similar thing that a network of discrete points with some kind of fluctuation that gives rise to continuum and the physical space. So there is very, very similarity. And uh, we hope that it is possible to build up the Akasho, which our uh, research, they envisaged in the thousand and thousand years before. Now uh, to understand more deeply. I mean, like if you say network, network means this network normally doesn't have a semantic aspect. I mean, in physical world or in the brain, even default network, we have, uh, we assign the meaning. I mean, you are looking at the object from the outside world, like an apple and the stimulus comes and through brain's network, it comes to the center nervous system. And at a certain instant, we say, well, this is apple. But the network, all kinds of network, which you have done already, they lack one thing, how the semantic aspect or meaning is being generated. I am I, uh, I, uh, looking for the input from traditional scholar that whether this kind of meaning generation is possible even with a framework starting from some other traditional wisdom or some other text. 
And in last slide, let me tell you, people used field metaphor and Akash, like Nikola Tesla. And I mean, Vivek, Shami Vivekananda met Nikola Tesla. And uh, more recently, Erwin Laszlo, uh, they call this, they are exist a field called Akashic field. Well, as I told you before, that there is misunderstanding, misunderstanding in the following sense. Field concept is very much useful because field means it contains infinite degrees of freedom. It's a good metaphor for describing consciousness. But if you want to use field concept for understanding this kind of akasho, then the problem is that for every kind of field which we understand in modern physics, it needs its supports for a particular well-defined geometric structure, which is normally Minkowskian. But this geometric structure is not there in Akasho. So the use of metaphor of field in describing Akasho is a kind of misconception. And quantum, quantum vacuum can be thought of equivalent to Akasho only if we think that this quantum vacuum is different from quantum vacuum used in cosmology, where quantum vacuum consists of many, many fields. Here, quantum vacuum is there is potentiality, but not exactly the field concept is there. So we need to have more insights from traditional scholars regarding this kind of issues that what exactly the chidakans means our understanding is that Chidakas, there is no space, no time in Chidakas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Roy. Uh, just to highlight, I mean, uh, the idea of the field theoretic aspect is one of many propositions, uh, not personally my, you know, um, you know, line that I draw between Akash and the field theory. Um, but thank you for that insight. I think the whole idea of pre-geometric notion and uh, the manner in which you have brought about the perturbation picture is, is quite insightful and, and valuable. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I would next like to call upon uh, Dr. Rama Jayasundar. Um, as I said, Dr. Rama Jayasundar has a very interesting um, combination of expertise, um, being an MR physicist, as well as having um, a, a training in Ayurveda, a degree in Ayurveda. Um, so she will be talking about the applications or the, or the relevance of Akasha in the context of um, medicine, in the context of biology and physiology, um, and, and beyond as well. Uh, so ma'am, I would like to uh, welcome you to, the, to discuss with us. Your yes. Uh, let me make a, a upfront disclaimer that uh, I do not have in-depth knowledge on this topic. Uh, but what I can, uh, you know, definitely uh, share with you all is how this concept is applied, uh, you know, in um, uh, in Ayurveda, which is a very, very pragmatic science. And so for this reason, you know, let me be the last panelist to pitch in. Uh, I would like to hear uh, more learned uh, panelists like Professor Ram and, you know, Professor Kak. And then, you know, I will tell how, uh, you know, see, after all, Ayurveda is the practical platform for all these uh, concepts and theories that you find in Indian knowledge system. So in that way, you know, it's very, very interesting to see how these concepts are translated in practice. So, but uh, let me, uh, I mean, I'm very keen to hear what Professor Ram uh, 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 has to say and pro what Professor Kak as well. And Professor Rai gave a very, very uh, insightful, uh, uh, you know, discourse on this. So yeah, I'll come a bit later. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, we would then go on to Professor Ram Subramaniam, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, a polymath, uh, a, you know, multidisciplinary uh, scholar of the highest uh, you know, order. And uh, we are really privileged to have you here with us, sir. So uh, please uh, share with us your insights into this area. Thank you, Professor Mrityanjai, as well as Professor Rama. Um, I had a little bit of difficulty in comprehending what Professor Shishir Rai was trying to communicate. But let me just share my own peace of mind with reference to the derivation of the word Akasha as we can do, and also explain certain terminologies that he introduced to you from the viewpoint of 
Sanskrit. The word, I mean, he started with, the Mrityanjay started with a quote, Kambayar Jyotira Paha Prithivi Vishwasya Dharini Ni. So we have the similar listing in Taittiriya Upanishad also, Atmana Akasha Sambhutaha, Akasha Dvayuhu, Vayoragni and so on. If we try to trace back the literature that is available in Sanskrit, the Rigveda seems to be the most ancient one. And in Rigveda, we do not find even the word Akasha appearing, to my knowledge. One can find the word Jauhu, etc. in Rigveda, but uh, the origin of Akasha does not seem to be discussed. Whether it is something which is eternal and so on, this is not discussed. Let me straight away get into the etymological derivation of the word Akasha, which may be useful for many of us. One way to derive Akasha is we can think of removing the prefix A and then we can think of the word Kashru. So Kashru Deeptau is the root to which the prefix A has been added. And therefore, one can understand the word Akasha to be derived as A Samantat Kashante Deeptiante. Now, Shishirai introduced three terms, Bhuta Kasha, Chitta Kasha and Chida Kasha. Interesting terms which have been employed by philosophers. Normally, one thinks of this Bhuta Kasha when we take the Upanishadic literature, Atmana Akasha Sambhutaha, it doesn't refer to Chidakasha. Atmana Akasha Sambhutaha only refers to this Bhutakasha. So Atman itself is Chidakasha. So Atmana Akasha Sambhutaha, when we say it refers to the Bhuta Kasha. With reference to Bhuta Kasha, how do we understand the word Akasha itself? A Samantat Kashante Deepyante, one can think of Surya Dayaha. So all those objects which are seen in the sky as illuminating objects, wherever they are shining, etc. It can be a matter which has self-illumination, it can be a matter which is dark, whatever it is. So wherever we see these objects to be presenting themselves from can be called as Akasha, it is Bhuta Akasha. In fact, one of the common definitions of Akasha is, so Avakasha Pradatru Akasha, that which provides space for other entities to be existing. This is one common notion that we find for Akasha. When it comes to the characteristics of Akasha, there are a few things which have been listed in the Upanishadic literature. We have the term Kutastha. So Kutastha means something which is unchanging. We also find the attribute Nitya associated with Akasha, but this has to be qualified right now. So Nitya means something which is eternal. We have this phrase in the Upanishad which has been time and again taken by Bhagavad Pada Shankaracharya also in the discussion. We have a, a string, Akashavat Sarvagatascha Nitya. So Akasha, Akashavat, when you say something which is close to Akasha, Akashavat Sarvagataha, Sarvagataha means something which is all pervasive. So when you want to describe the Atman, you use Akasha as a metaphor to convey something which is close to that about which you have developed a certain perception. So Akasha Vati, nobody can deny the fact that uh, the kind of notion that we have about Akasha is something which is all pervasive. So therefore, Akasha Vati Sarvagataha. The second thing that one can think of is when we conceive of material objects, they are made out of Sanghata. Sanghata essentially means something put together. So anything that has been put together which has parts is something which is going to disintegrate. On the other hand, one cannot think of Akasha to be put together made of certain elements and therefore one conceives it to be Nitya. So, in fact, there is an interesting sutra which goes as Yavad Vikarantu Vipago Lokavati. In fact, there is a very interesting discussion which runs through seven sutras. 
so there what one finds is so one takes the position that akasha is to be taken as eternal and one cannot think of the utpatti of akasha utpatti means something which gets gets generated at a certain point of time so this brings to the view that newton maintained long back <laughs> that it is unchanging that it is eternal and it is something say after all it is considered to be motionless achala so these are all attributes see achala and vibhu so all pervasive so this infinite nature of akasha so eternality of akasha unchanging nature of akasha and being motionless these are certain attributes which we find the newton to be the question is whether akasha should be considered as nitya or as an emergent phenomenon this has been discussed by physicists for a long time and today our understanding is definitely that it is also to be conceived as an emergent phenomenon rather than something which is eternal and this question has been addressed from a different view point in the advaita vedanta and they have also called this akasha as emergent that is why atmana akasha sambhutaha we have it. so it is something which has emerged and therefore this nityatva cannot be attributed to akasha on the other hand and as described by shishya so this chidakasha is what we are primarily referring to as atman so this chidakasha is something which is eternal so though the word akasha has been employed tagged to all the three so what we usually conceive of is the physical space and this physical space seems to be the boundary of our understanding so we we know about matter we know about things and uh, today there is a lot of discussion that is going on uh, so so we moved on from uh, newtonian framework to special relativity and then to general relativity and then we moved on to quantum field theory and then comes uh, this quantum electrodynamics and then we have all this vibration which are being talked about i have certain reservations in trying to connect with these things because these are all certain things which are emerging now we don't have a final word on this so if we try to map any of them then i think there is a danger that uh, we may end up mixing certain things so as far as uh, to summarize what i want to say is chitta akasha when you say this chitta akasha basically refers to i can even uh, derive the word akasha with reference to this so if you want to refer to the bhuta akasha you can say where surya daya bhasanti okay deepyanti if you want to refer to our own chitta akasha where this see, one can think of rasa daya yatra bhasanti see at all and when you want to use the word akasha with chitta akasha so then one can say vijnana daya so all the knowledge wherever it arises so this is another thing that we talk of so this akasha is basically so where something becomes evident so this is what it essentially means where something shines this is what it means so wherever something shines so if you want to say chitta if you want to say vyas if you want to say bhuta so then i think one has to appropriately derive now let me very quickly conclude what i want to say so this uh, question of what akasha is see so both advaitins have been struggling philosophers have been struggling and the physicists have been struggling so akasha to us seems to be the boundary between what is known and unknown okay so the boundary in the question when the view when one considers the physicist view point and when considers the view point of advaitins they are somewhat quite different is what my feeling is see that which makes the world evident see so is what you call as this so this atman see so that which is beyond the space so after all when you take the taittiriya upanishad atmana akasha sambhuta we know all these things and beyond that is what you call as brahman so what is this beyond and what is its nature so that which makes the world evident to us is what we call as chida akasha here see you are a pramata you are able to see so as far as this akasha is concerned so when you investigate on what is beyond the space so with reference to advaita you describe this entity completely differently whereas in the case of so this is something which is to be conceived as both the observer and the observed so because it is considered as an effect 
On the other hand, from the viewpoint of physics, this akasha, whatever quantum fluctuation, it is purely considered as an object that has to be studied. Whereas chidakasha is not merely an object. If you take the important phrase that has been given by Bhagavad Pada right at the beginning of Adhyaya Sabatya, so he questions this. See? So he says, Katham punaha pratyagatmani vishaye adhyasaha. So there he says, Nachayam ekantena avishayaha asmat pratyaya vishayatvatu. So Chidakasha cannot be considered as something which is to be known by us. It is in fact the knower too. Asmat pratyaya vishayatvatu. Aparokshatvacha pratyagatma prasiddhe. It is a very, very important phrase which requires a lot of explanation, but I think I'll just skip. So I'll just complete in one minute. So as far as physics is concerned, see, what is required is a real distinction between the subject and the object. See, between observer and the observed, what lies beyond space is not pure awareness as we talk about in the Vedantic philosophy. Rather, what is expected is an object to be studied, analyzed, and elucidated, so that can be known through good insights and better resources. So this is the epistemological position that uh, differs from the approach of Vedanta and the physicist, is what I would just say. But what is interesting is, so this investigation that is being taken up by both the philosophers of physics and the Advaitins, is what is that entity which actually has given rise to which this Akasha and from which, I mean, one can think of either the Nyaya philosophy or Advaita philosophy or Sancha philosophy from which the manifest world has emanated. So, see, in fact, in Advaita, we call <laughs> Kasminna Vijnate Sarvamidam Vijnatam Bhavati. This is the kind of question that is being posed. So that same question is addressed from completely two different viewpoints. And the answers that seem to be emerging also have similarity, but they also have a lot of dissimilarities. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Professor Ramasubramaniam. Uh, I think that was, uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, discussion points, which I'm sure uh, our attendees here will take up. I mean, so the format that we have kept is that the question, answer, and subsequent discussion will be uh, after uh, our last speakers have also spoken. Uh, so thank you, sir. Thank you for giving your insights on this day. Um, I would like to now, because I see that Professor Subhash Kak has not joined yet, and I think that is uh, partially because he's joining from the US and he's traveling as well. So he just did mention before the event that he may have some problem with the network. So I would just like to go on to uh, Professor Raman Jayasundar at this point. Uh, thank you, Professor Ram, for that uh, wonderful explanation. Uh, so let me uh, um, try and share with you all how this is uh, takes a practical form in Ayurveda. So I will, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello? Yes, yes. We can yes, hear. yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Rama, we can hear you. We wish he has lost. Hello? Yes, yes. Um, we can hear you, Professor Rama. So some problem with the... If she's joining again, uh, so let us just wait for a few minutes. Okay, um, right, she's here. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, it's, it's raining heavily here, so yes. net connection was a problem. Uh, so, uh, so let me let me give a very very brief, as brief a background as how uh, uh, as possible as to how Ayurveda um, uh, tries to understand uh, uh, the the human system. Uh, the health and as well as disease conditions uh, using, of course, the fundamental matrix of uh, Panchamahabhuta. 
So Ayurveda, of course, is uh, uh, uses the Shad Darshanas, uh, Vaiseshika, Sankhya, and uh, you know Nyaya, etc. And it talks about uh, uh, nine dravyas that Vaiseshika talks about. That is the Panchamaha Bhutas, uh, Kala, Dik, Atma, and Manas. And it says that all these uh, play a big role in health and disease. And because of these, uh, it considers all these nine entities as dravyas. So we generally translate dravya as uh, you know, physical substance, but we will see that it has both physical and non-physical entities. Uh, so just to give you all a very quick understanding of uh, how the human system is understood uh, in Ayurveda, it uses biophysical parameters to understand. So what it does is it um, looks at it from a very uh, uh, functional way. So it, it, it has identified three major functions uh, uh, in the human system, which is uh, uh, you know, growth and metabolism, uh, metabolism and transformation, and movement and growth. And uh, these are called uh, vata, pitta, and kapha. And vata uh, and these doshas are again you know, related to panchamaha bhutas. And, uh, and, and then what it does is it uh, uh, looks at, it groups under these vata, pitta, and kapha a set of parameters which impact these functions. And these are predominantly biophysical in nature. So for example, lagu, which means light, uh, mridu, which means soft, uh, sukshma, which means very fine, and vyavayi, guru, snigda, all these are biophysical properties uh, that, uh, that impact these functions that, uh, that are identified with the human system. And what is interesting is that these, some of these biophysical properties are associated with Panchamahaputta. So, for example, if we take Akash, Lagu, uh, which is which means light. So, when Ayurveda says that something is Lagu, it means that physically it is light, uh, and internally, that is when a person uh, ingests takes uh, takes it in as a food or as medicine, it is light to digest. So, when it says Guru, so the substance is physically heavy, and it's also heavy to digest. So all these biophysical properties have an external and an internal reference. So there are three properties which actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mention uh, the Panchamaha Bhutta Akash. One is Lagu. Uh, so this property of Lagu has Vayu and Akash, uh, you know, uh, in it. And Mridu has Jala Mahabhuta and Akash Mahabhuta. And Sukshma which means very fine. So a substance which is sukshma can actually penetrate very, very easily. So for example, let's say a medicine is sukshma. It means that it can penetrate all the tissues and the cells at the, at the very subtlest level. So sukshma also has akash, vayu, and agni. And then akash also has organs associated with it. For example, organ of hearing. So we know that sound is an attribute of Akash. So organ of hearing um, uh, and mouth, throat, lips, and all the openings in the body have association with Akash. And it, it uh, uh, Professor Ram was mentioning about whether it's a fundamental property or it's an emergent phenomenon. So Ayurveda treats it like an emergent phenomenon, especially when it talks about growth of fetus. So Akash plays a very, very uh, fundamental, important role because it creates the spaces uh, uh, within the fetus. And so it gives a boundary for each organ and that's how a fetus develops. So, and then uh, even in between, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in, in a grown up adult, uh, Akash is again, you know, uh, it, it causes a separation between structures and in certain disease conditions, where the separation increases or there is a shrinkage of, uh, of organs of tissues and then there is the space is increased, Akash has a specific role in it. So if, if when they talk about uh, uh, medicines, how to prepare medicines and what kind of medicine should be administered for uh, certain diseases, again, you know, the Panchamaha Bhutas uh, play a very important role. 
So for uh, uh, diseases where uh, Akash and Vayu are involved, uh, there are the plants are also uh, um, uh, classified according to Vata, Pitta and Kapha. In other words, it is uh, understood in terms of the Panchamaha Bhutas. So the, the ones which have uh, Akash in excess, so that is used in certain disease conditions. So this is how, you know, Ayurveda gives a practical expression of, uh, uh, you know, Akash, when, whether it is in understanding of how the human system works or in understanding disease or health and how it manages. So in a nutshell, this is how, you know, this uh, uh, concept of Panchamaha Bhutas have been translated into a practical way uh, in, uh, for handling health and disease. Thank you, Professor Jaswinder. Um, that was uh, very kind of uh, the application side of things, the avenues in which the um, you know the harnessing of the understanding thereof of Akasha is important. Um, we would now like to move into the discussion section. I do, I do still see that uh, Professor Kark has not been able to join yet. Um, so as and when he does, we will have his intervention. Um, but otherwise, uh, could I request Ajay to please uh, put this into the gallery mode so that it can be easier to until the discussion. Yes, okay. So, um, so we will now open it out to the uh, attendees here. Uh, if you have any questions, observations, or comments, um, please feel free to kind of um, go ahead. Uh, but please raise uh, the reaction called uh, raise your hand, basically, which is available on Zoom. So that it's a little more ordered. So anyone who wants to begin, could uh, please do so. This is also the time to ask questions. We have had three speakers who have given us very insightful and interesting places where Akasha, the, the whole conceptualization of Akasha and applications has come through. Any questions? Jayanji, would you like to? Uh I, I would like to listen to them. That's okay. all. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sumit, Dr. Sumit Kumar Mishra has a point or a question. Please go ahead. Ji, uh, thank you, uh, ji. Uh, it's me, um, my question is something like uh, because we discussed about the Akasha spanning from Earth's surface to that of uh, uh, like unbounded space. So, uh, with whether there is any quantification related to ionosphere and beyond, like if I say that up to ionosphere, there is something, or it can be discretized, or whatsoever, like conceptually, what's uh, is there any uh, any view uh, on this, like uh, up to ionosphere and beyond? So, in terms of quantification, because we consider Akash as a like spanning from Earth surface and unbounded space. So, uh, is there any view up to ionosphere or any quantification like, uh, like, as in uh, modern science, we say troposphere, stratosphere, thermomesosphere, and like ionosphere. So, uh, my view is, uh, I just want to have views or uh, on this on the, by speakers. Um, okay. Yes. Professor Ramasubrani, if you want to. Okay. So this uh, space was what we have to understand is space was initially considered to be finite if we go back to the Greek philosopher's time. Later, it was understood to be infinite. So since you are bringing in this notion of uh, ionosphere and so on and so forth, this is all something which has to do with the Earth-centric view. So this Aristotelian view started with the eccentric thing. And then, I mean, you can think of building various spheres around you as the center. So within that, I mean, you can think of various layers at various distances for various reasons, which we have done today. But space is something which is much beyond. So whether you take Aristotelian picture or you take Newtonian picture or you take the picture of QFT, so space is something which is very different. So from these kinds of spheres, which are delimited by us for a certain explanation that we want to give. Okay. So for certain phenomena, that is what we have to understand. Uh, Professor Ramajai Sundar or Shishiroi, would you like to add to that? 
no, not exactly, but I have a question for Professor Ram. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, how do you look at the way that Ayurveda has uh, used this concept, uh, you know, to, to uh, uh, understand and handle health? It's a very, very practical way of doing things. So do you see a big difference between the theory, uh, uh, theory of Akash or what it is, what it could be, and how uh, Ayurveda has used it in a slightly narrower way? Uh, Professor Rama, if you can give me the verses where some such descriptions are there, then I will be able to perhaps explain how this concept has been taken into Ayurveda for practical application. So since I have not looked into any of these Ayurvedic texts. So it has drawn, as you said, so most of our systems have drawn this basic understanding that emerges from the Upanishad. And then we have classified Vaisheshika and Nyaya system, as you rightly said, has classified the entities into nine categories, primarily as Dravyas. So the much broader category. So the Ravya Guna Karma Sama under Dravya come all of these things. So this uh, notion of space as handled by Vaisheshikas is something which is very different from the way it has been looked at by the Vedantins. So different philosophers have, so whether you take Sankhya philosophy or Nyaya Vaisheshika philosophy or Advaita philosophy, each of these philosophers have looked at space slightly differently, though there will be some common features among all the philosophers. So Nyaya may take the position that Akasha is Nitya, whereas Advaita would not consider the position Akasha as Nitya. So this is with reference to what we generally call as Bhutakasha. So this Bhutakasha so is Nitya. So Vibhu is something which is common to both of them, but Nitya is not something which is common to Advaita. So this uh, philosophical discussion on Akasha, which is what takes place in most of these darshanas, so is something which may be very different from what is discussed in, if at all there is some detailed discussion in any of these Ayurveda works, I will be very happy to know the verses. And then after looking at it, those verses, perhaps I may be able to give some interpretation, but not offhand. Unfortunately, often I do not uh, know the verses, but I can, uh, you know, revert back. But I can tell you that, you know, in either Charaka Samhita or Sushruta Samhita or Ashtanga Sangraha, you know, uh, these would not be uh, explained in detail. Uh, so what that we have to probably, I have to look for is the commentaries. Yeah. You know, that's where these would have been, you know, uh, expanded and, you know, articulated in a more elaborate manner. But yeah. I will definitely look into this and, you know, get back to you, revert yeah. and, you know, try <laughs> to learn more uh, about this. Yeah, yeah. But of course, you know, I mean, one of the reasons I have uh, not uh, been looking at this aspect is uh, it, it's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the modern biologists, and the doctors, they know that, you know, the human body is made up of atoms, right? But they handle it at a slightly different level, higher level. So although the basic understanding is that it's not really required for practical practicalities. So the same way, you know, Ayurveda also, also the funda although the fundamental matrix is uh, Panchamaha Bhuta, it's not really necessary to kind of, you know, work from that level. So for that particular reason, you know, I have not really focused on this, but this is a very, very interesting fundamental aspect. Now we know it has got me interested as well. I will revert to you. Yeah, so perhaps, I mean, they may bring in these kinds of philosophical discussions in the Ayurvedic text in order to impress upon the fact that you cannot conceive them to be brute and stupid. So this is another very important thing that uh, if you just take it along these lines, so then I think this kind of a view that you have towards these things may change. And this change in view will have a lot of impact in our approach to life as well as approach to the nature. <laughs> uh, I have uh, some question to Professor Ram. Yes, please. Uh, what uh, we understand even from Nashodhya Shukto that in the yes. beginning, you know, eternal and unchanging but uh, the Jagat, the universe, which is changing. So from unchanging to changing, I mean, what 
the vedic yeah. wisdom says more about that yes uh let me just tell you professor shishir rai so let us uh, leave out nasadiya sukta for the moment nasadiya sukta is i mean uh, conveying a certain powerful idea that uh, we should uh, just not think at any point of time that we have understood everything in fact this is a major uh, thing nasadasi nosadasi tadani nasidrajo novyoma parvayati in fact it basically exclaims that uh, so this is something which is beyond my complete comprehension so this beyond complete comprehension is true in physics is true in physics chemistry is true in biology is true in mathematics is true in any discipline that we want to pursue today so uh, this is a sort of a different kind of a exclamation that we find in this so whether i would describe this as existing or non existing so these are the kinds of things whether you would like to describe it as energy or you would like to describe this as matter so these are all so at various times uh, something uh, presents to us so we have to understand so we as human beings have a certain kind of comprehension which is developed at a given point of time based on the tools that have been developed and the understanding that has been built so this is something which we have to keep as the fundamental thing now with regard to this akasha see, with regard to this akasha so stretching and then uh, saying so that is what i wanted to tell you even with reference to the phrases that you were employing at one point of time you were even quoting this anej dekam manaso jiviyo nainad deva apnuvan purvamarshat tadhavat vamyanate tishthatasmin napoma karishva adhati now there is a certain problem which i see when uh, see for a specific purpose one can try to give a certain interpretation so for instance even in upanishad you will find the word atma used to refer to our buddhi you may find atma to refer to this physical body you may find atma to refer to something which is the primordial entity which has given the birth to the entire universe so these are things which can be derived from the word and from the context alone you should be able to fix the meaning of that this is true of any literature now this matari shwa also i had this kind of a problem so matari shwayate so one can uh, see from that i mean uh, space with vibration etc and uh, this is from the view point of what we have understood from quantum perturbation if we try to bring in this meaning so i think it is a little uh, tricky so i don't uh, <laughs> find it very appealing to me so this is uh, something which i thought i should uh, share with you so from the view point of akasha as such the word so one meaning which i gave was asamantat kashate what kashate i mean you can fix either the sun moon etc you can fix some emotions etc you can fix something else on the other hand so one can think of so the word to simply mean bhutakasha see so to refer to that alone so there is another way of understanding this prefix a so there na kashate so normally when we say na satya asatya right so this uh, a when it is prefixed with something so na kashate means na deepyate so you take this bottle you take any other entity you are able to see something see that is perceptible to you so this akasha is not something which is perceptible to you so one can get this meaning also so one can think of forming the word as na kashate prithivi adivati see like prithivi etc that it is not evident to us so this is akasha okay so this is another way of deriving the word which is acceptable so how do you get uh, the word a one can say so it should be like asatya it should be short form it is not true so one can think of nipata one can call as these are all acceptable derivations okay for akasha so na kashate prithivyadivat akasha these are the two possible derivation that one can think of for this word but associating it with <laughs> so other things is a little difficult for me so this is what i wanted to share with you Uh, because you know uh, in nowadays in physics in especially quantum field theory and other quantum gravity and other things uh, we are looking for ontology of space time even ontology of quantum correct 
very true very true i completely agree with you so what is the ontological status of akasha is something which is a very interesting question now this atman see so this whether you take nyaya whether you take advaita etc so all of us do accept that there is something which is primordial which has given rise to this entity which we are able to perceive as universe today and uh, we form a part of the universe so and therefore we are observers in a sense and we are also observed i mean in a different sense now this observer aspect is what one understands from the word chidakasha okay so the chaitanya which is able to make us perceive things so whether the electron uh, has uh, uh, this capacity or not i mean uh, so that it is able to sense the other object is something which is common okay so if we want to take it to that level so that the existence of some other entity is something which is perceived by that so uh, it is sensed by that in a different way so different entities have different levels of sensibilities and uh, we are the one as we understand today who have the greatest sensibility so and therefore there is a certain inquisity for us to try and understand and uh, this position of uh, trying to explore whether the quantum vacuum and the fluctuations there could be conceived and traced back to upanishad is a little tricky for me okay thank you but <laughs> you know i can mention one uh, uh, idea from a great botan a great biologist jb holden yes holden yes holden yes so yes. in 1932 the british journal of philosophical science they started yes. publishing the whole journal and in the first issue J. B. Sheldon wrote that uh, the propensity of hydrogen to combine oxygen in the consciousness of the elements. He tried to. Yeah. Be- so see this, this, this. See different things get combined in different ways. See, for instance, when we want to explain the formation of some entity, so if you take the simplest way of explaining things, so you just take car. I mean, uh, so if, if there are various parts. so the parts from the material cause and uh, the union actually there are different causes which one can think of so they call it in our uh, literature samavayi karana samavayi karana nimitta karana and so on so this is a broad classification of what are the causes ultimately the uh, the ultimately the aim of science is to understand the cause and effect right so irrespective of which field do we do i mean it can be brought to that level so what causes what so this is what we try to understand so here we do in a particular way so this uh, something joins with something so consciously the human does it okay so at some level at some level it is happening on its own now which is the consciousness so we generally try to understand from our perspective that unless there is a chaitanya the sachetanas do not join and then create something so the sachetana is being unified okay to give a certain property when you want to say and you then conceive of a larger consciousness so this consciousness that we possess is in fact uh, let me just tell you one more interesting verse so this akasha is used in gaudapada karika okay so in gaudapada parika so there are atma yakashavat jeevaihi ghatakashe ribodita ghatadivacha sanghataihi jata vetan nidarshanam in fact there are a few verses which beautifully use this akasha to make us you rather i would put it this way to use your own terminology they use the bhutakasha to make us appreciate the chidakasha so atma hi akashavat when you say this atma is this chidakasha if you want to so akashavat when he says it is like the bhutakasha atma hi akashavat 
Jeevaihi Ghatakashi Nibodhitaha. So this Jeevas are like Ghatakasha. So Ghatakasha, Matakasha, Akasha in this box, etc. So they are limited space. But this space which is there inside the pot is not different from the large space that we can think of. It is because of this limitation we are trying to describe it by a certain terminology. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have Dr. Surendra Pokharna who has been wanting to raise this point. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, sir, you are uh, on mute. If you could unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, sorry, bringing about such an exciting discussion on fundamental problems. Uh, there are two, three things I just want to talk about. Uh, when we talk about uh, Newtonian physics, then we say space and time are different. But when we talk of Einstein's contribution, then he has combined space with time. Now, time means some kind of change. Now, at macro level, we talk of the Lorentz equations and all those things, I mean, uh, but uh, does it have any implications at uh, micro level also? So it means that uh, space and time, if they are uh, not separable from each other, then we have to talk them as mixed things. So fluctuations has to be an intrinsic property of the nature. This is what it looks like. And this idea is given in Jainism also that vibrations is a very, very important concept at fundamental level. Uh, this is my uh, 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 the first question. And the second question is to Madam, uh, who was talking about Ayurvedic, uh, these medicines and these different levels. Uh, I just want to add that in homeopathy, if we dilute a medicine uh, by the number, this uh, uh, this, uh, this one tenth, uh, this, I mean, uh, this one tenth or one hundredth or like that, then its strength increases. Now, this is something very, very typical indeed, and people are trying to explain it using the weak solutions, the strength of um, this uh, properties of weak solutions and all that. But I think this uh, working of homeopathic medicines has something to do with uh, what Madam is talking about, that something at non-physical level, something is operating. So just, I, I mean, these two questions. I will request the speakers to be uh, concise in their discussion, please, because we have a lot of people who are interested in asking questions. Um, who would like to take the first part? Um, because uh, Ramasubramaniam, would you have any thoughts on that? Uh, <laughs> see, you said it is essentially not a question as I understood. You were saying that this notion of vibrations has been considered to be fundamental even in the Jaina philosophy. So there is nothing which is different in other systems. You may use a particular word in a particular philosophy to refer to something. So vibration is essentially change in position, you can think of. So this essentially can be understood as some parinama, essentially some change. So Parinama is fundamental, is something which is understood by every individual who makes any sort of observations. So in fact, right from Yaska's philosophy, so we have, so they basically classify this into a variety of types, Jayate, Asti, Vardhate, Parinamate, Apakshiyate, Nasyati. So this is something which is a cycle which we observe in every entity around us. Okay. So therefore, I don't think there is anything which you have asked with reference to that. This is something which is accepted across, okay? So sciences as well as philosophy. This is all I would like to say. Uh, I think the second question was to Professor Rama. Uh, yeah, but the first question is not uh, completely answered. I am asking that when Einstein says that space and time, they are combined together, they are coupled, they are not separate. In that case, what is the stand of our philosophies in this contract that if they are combined, then uh, which one will represent out of this? Three, this uh... no, no, no. So please understand. So when you say, so this is something one is connected with the other. That is all one has to understand. This doesn't mean, so one does not understand space and time separately. So please uh, be clear about it. That's okay? implication. So, no, no, no. Once again. No, what I want to say is when you want to describe a certain phenomenon at a different level, 
I mean, you cannot separate this from that. I mean, when you want to have a much larger picture. So this doesn't mean that when I say, so this bottle is on my table. So you only refer to space. So if it is moved from this, I mean, uh, this is in a different space. Okay. So this uh, time and space, I mean, they have uh, different uh, connotations. So that one cannot just uh, deny that. So just because Einstein has come up with a picture. <laughs> Uh, Professor Roy, would you yeah. So that space is not absolute, is something which he has proved. So there is something called space contraction and it is closely connected with the observer, etc. I mean, that is a different kind of a picture which knocked off both Aristotelian as well as Newtonian picture so in a larger framework. No, I, I don't understand really the question. So yeah. the question as, I, as I understood, no, is that we should get a connection of space and time. What does our treatises or our tradition have to say about that kind of? Does it have any implications that implications space for... and time are combined? Does it have any implications, or can we say that the quantum fluctuations are just because of this this intrinsic connection between space and time? So those changes will be there because space and time are not separable. No, so, even, even quantum fluctuation is there, uh, non-relativistic domain. So yeah. There is no question of, I mean, Minkowski and things and other. Yeah. Okay, I think that's the correct answer. I think yeah. that is the correct yes, answer. And the second question, I think, was for Professor Rama. So please, yes. Yeah. I think the second was not really a question. So he was yeah. making a statement that, uh, you know, in uh, the, the how medicines are prepared in homeopathy and how dilutions are used, right? And so they do talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, vibrations and, you know, that retaining the memory of what the, uh, the initial ingredients would do. But, uh, I mean, in, in Ayurveda, it's an entirely different thing. And uh, uh, so, you know, I mean, that way, as far as medicines are concerned, there is no connection between how medicines are made in homeopathy and how it is done in uh, Ayurveda. Of course, Ayurveda talks about... Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, physical interventions, physical medicines and non-pharmacological interventions as well. And as far as the physical interventions are, uh, uh, or where medicine, Ayurveda talks about medicine, these are broth ingredients which are mixed in different proportions and these ingredients are uh, explained or understood in terms of the guna. Uh, what it can do, what are the changes it can cause. So it's not understood so much by uh, the, 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 the structural nuances in it, not the molecules. So all the, all the uh, medicines in Ayurveda are explained in terms of the biophysical changes it can cause. So for example, uh, you know, if you take, uh, let's take osteoarthritis and uh, Ayurveda says that the um, uh, kapha, Kapha, which uh, causes lubrication, uh, it is reduced be between joints. So there is a dryness uh, which has resulted and the therapeutic target becomes the dryness. So medicines are, uh, ingredients are used, uh, the ones which have sneaked that one, which can increase the, uh, reduce the dryness and increase the uh, lubrication. So this is the whole, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, background context in which Ayurvedic medicines are made, and they are very different to, uh, you know, how uh, medicines are made in homeopathy. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, just uh, Mrityanjay, just one second. So I just want to add one thing. See the dilution and the strength. So this, uh, there are three words. So dilution, power, strength. Perhaps, in my understanding, so you can dilute it uh, one tenth, one fifteenth, one fiftieth, whatever. So see, the concentration does not increase. So the ability, rather the power of the medicine in curing something may be increasing by this phenomenon. That should not be confused with the concentration of the ingredient in that. So this, this is my understanding. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a little question to Professor Ram? Yes. Ram? Sir, actually, if you don't mind, there are some people who have been waiting for a while. If, if we can take theirs first and then we can come to okay. you. Okay. 
Uh, so uh, we have Shashi Kumar Himan, who uh, has been waiting for a while. Uh, please go ahead, your comment. Question. Yeah, so uh, I'm audible, huh? I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Professor Ranki, I have a very simple query, although we have answered very nicely the concept of Akasa in, in reference to the modern science, maybe astrophysics, astronomy, and whatever we understand in stellar medium about the universe. So can you just, you see, you believe in uh, only a number of uh, Akasas which exist? like maybe theoretically people believe that number of universe exist in a stellar medium. Or another thing is, can your concept or the philosophy right now, you are just explaining to us, can tell us about the life of Akasa, how much is the life has passed by the Akasa till date? Yeah, okay. Now, see, when you talk about this universe, Mm -hmm. I want to know which universe are you talking about? Every individual has created his own universe in his mind. Now the universe in which we believe it we is are physical living. universe that you are referring to, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. So when you say the physical universe, there is only one universe. The universe is a term yeah. which is all encompassing. So this is my understanding of the word universe. Okay. Now this un this universe is something which is expanding, whether it is contracting, whether it will expand forever, whether it will contract at some point of time, etc., is something which is being debated by us, which has to do with the various kinds of matter that we find in this universe. So what is going to be the fate of this matter? So this is a question that is being addressed by various cosmologists. Now, the space is something which is conceived as which accommodates this. So there are different views. That is why I said, so from the viewpoint of uh, Greek philosopher, this is something which is, there is something which is called as starry sphere. So space, there is nothing beyond that. Okay, there is no notion. So within that huge sphere which they conceived of, inside you can think of space. Now this Newton opened up and then, so he said, so later when you go to quantum field theory, so this matter itself, I mean, takes this kind of a, so the space, the, the space itself becomes curved, etc. It has nothing to do with this absolute nature of space that uh, he is talking about. So today our understanding is that, so the space as we understand is something which is not absolute, uh, which uh, this Newtonian framework or our own intuition tries to provide us. So we have to be very clear about this. So this space, whether how long will it exist, etc., is not the question. So as long as there is observer and we are describing, the space will exist. So in whichever notion that you want to understand space, that is different. Okay. So for us, space is, I mean, something which, uh, where the matter can <laughs> position itself. This is the kind of understanding that we have about the space. Okay. Yeah, that's right, but but you see, philosophically, can you extrapolate the life of Akasa? This, but no, no, what do you mean by extrapolating? So, so maybe you see, people now now we claim <laughs> that the life of the inverse is uh, the life of inverse in which we are living, maybe around uh, fourteen billion years. So can you say something about the no, no, life wait, of Akasa? Wait, 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 wait. Hmm. I think there is a misconception. Okay. So our understanding of the age of universe, there is nothing like life of universe. So please understand okay. this. Okay. When we say age of universe, it is 14, whatever be the number that you are talking about. Oh, yeah, 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 that says. Yeah, right. ah, so this, uh, we don't have any clue whatsoever. Okay. I can be emphatic on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when this is going to collapse back into some point like Big Bang or, so we have no idea. So based on our understanding of physics and our understanding of the mathematical models that we can create and the observations and the analysis that we have carried out, we have estimated that this Big Bang explosion, I mean, uh, so there are other models also. If we go by this model, I mean, uh, your estimate of the age of the current universe that you are able to see is something like 14.3 billion. There is nothing like you can do. I mean, you are nothing. The entire Milky Way galaxy is nothing in our understanding of the cosmology. What can you do about this? So we cannot do anything about extending the life of space or time or universe. 
Now, what you see, we assume that maybe one day it will die. That's a different story. But do can I say something about akasa? Also, the concept of akasa that uh, it has life. If it has life, then it will die. Or if it has a life, then it was born sometime. Can we say no, no, something? No, please, so that? that is why I said I presented both the, all the three pictures to you. Okay. <laughs> so that this akasha is finite, that this akasha is infinite. Once you take it, is eternal Newtonian picture, which is what we generally have. So what is it that we define as space? So this is something which uh, has evolved over a period of time. So we should not just, uh, that is why, I mean, even the terminologies I was trying to explain. So mm. they try to associate Akasha mm. to Chida Akasha, to space, to Chitta, to Bhuta and so on and so forth. So because this notion of space, so has variety of connotations. See? So in our common parlance, when we say space, so this, uh, so the space in which I live is very small means, I mean, the kind of walls that we are talking about or the barricades which we have created around ourselves. This is one kind of a space. So the space that we talk about, so the space around this, which is curved space see, of any massive object. I mean, that is a different kind of a thing. So, okay, okay. Th thank you, Professor Ramke. So I oh, think might be many people are waiting to interact with you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Hemwati. Uh, Hemwati ji, you can go ahead, please. Uh, no, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Uh, namaste. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the humanity speakers, Professor Ram, Ramaji, and uh, Professor Roy. Uh, my uh, first question is to Professor Roy. Uh, if I am not missed, then Professor Roy, you have uh, mentioned about the quantum vacuum in cosmology. Uh, something like with, with different uh, sorts of fields over there, right? Uh, similar uh, fields, uh, they appear in field theoretic aspects of gravity when we deal with different things over there. Uh, could you please uh, comment on this and, uh, a bit more that how this uh, quantum vacuum concept is uh, related to this Akashtra? Exactly. I missed it actually. Not... Uh, yeah, what I am trying to emphasize that the quantum, yeah. the cosmology is considered, uh, yeah. we are not treating that kind of quantum vacuum. What we are treating? Okay. Quantum vacuum with space and kind of vibration. Uh, these vibrations are this quantum fluctuations, what we say? Yeah, or? Fluctuation. Because quantum fluctuation okay. is all pervading ubiquitous. Yes. Every. Okay. But there is no concept of field there. Because if you consider field, a lot of constraints, a lot of geometrical constraints should be there. Uh, like, like what? what? Why could you uh, why, please say, mention? You, say you consider electromagnetic, quantized electromagnetic fields. Right. So for description of that, you need Minkowskian structure. Sure. So right. When you consider Minkowskian structure, it means you are considering a lot of constraints. But we are... Okay. We are, we, uh, we are not considering that kind of constraints. So then both these are uh, different pictures actually, right? No, no, no. It's a modern thing. And... What we are saying that you cannot consider this quantum vacuum in cosmology. What we are considering a kind of pre-geometric notion. But there is no concept of geometry. Whether there exists okay. more fundamental notion than geometric okay. notion. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Tinjaji, could my, I could ask one more question to Professor Ram? Okay, please keep it short, please. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just like uh, in the previous question, Professor uh, Dhiman asked about this uh, physical universe. But actually, in, in our uh, literature, uh, there is the notion about the cyclic universe, right? So, universe will born and it will die, and then again, new universe will born. If we talk in terms of this physical universe, but while this in modern thing, uh, this is uh, there are the observational evidences that universe is expanding forever. So, uh, could you please put some light on this on the cyclic universe uh, yeah. in view of the Sarkastata, please? Let, let me just tell you that uh, in my understanding that today we do not have a concrete picture as to what may happen to the universe that we are observing. Okay. 
so okay. that it is going to be expanding if you are making a statement then the t is not acceptable okay even to those okay. businesses so this yeah, is, yeah. that is one possibility now yeah. when we talk of this cyclic thing it essentially means something in one form moves to some other original form and then gets manifested to in the some other form so this is what okay. one means by a cycle so when we talk about certain cycle so okay. this uh, this utpatti and pralaya these are the two terms that we use in yeah our uh, scriptures utpatti right, right. is essentially some manifest form in which you are able to recognize the existence of an entity so when it comes uh-huh. to stay okay so then it goes a certain transformation as somebody was telling and then it sort of decays we we know of things today which will come into existence only for 10 to the power minus 20 seconds and then it may suddenly go away we know of yes. things which can uh, be of 10 to the power 20 or even more and then uh, this this is this, this is that cycle of that okay the life of okay. that itself is a cycle right. so we right. try to extend from what we have observed in our own time scales for the entire universe and this is something which nobody can witness but one can only infer okay from what is happening okay. yeah. yeah so this okay. our understanding is that everything goes under a certain cycle okay. including universe okay thank you it doesn't mean that universe ceases completely please <laughs> So yeah, yeah. to some other yeah. form. <laughs> Actually, uh... yeah, yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll just take one other question, which we have uh, Ravi Kant Tata, who has been um, seeking to ask a question or raise a point. Please go ahead, Ravi Kant. Uh, uh, am I audible? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, just a moment, Ravi Kant. Yes, Hemadhi ji, do you have something to add? Yeah. To that? yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, right. there are two things, right? Uh, at the theoretical uh, front, uh, there are in, still in modern cosmology, there are people who believe there is cyclic universe. But observational front, if you see, uh, we have the evidences that the universe is only expanding forever. So Absolutely. No. there is no there. Is. No, forever. Absolutely. Don't add that. So currently, it is expanding. That yeah. is our understanding. So forever, yeah, it will add. Right. right. <laughs> Right. Those who talk about cyclic, they also say it is expanding now. <laughs> At present, right? Present book, right? Thank you. Uh, Ravi Kant, Ravi Kant, Tata, can you? Yeah. Uh, very good evening and pranam to all the luminaries. I have a question regarding what is the connection between Akash Tattva and the Omkaram or the subtlest of subtle? and uh, i want ram sir to uh, elucidate on uh, uh, because i have read something in tarsarko upanishad that uh, uh, the om or the primordial sound or the uh, the subatomic particles are uh, present in huge number in the sky okay This- now uh, Om is essentially a kind of frequency that is audible to us when we utter something in a particular form. So let us first be clear about it. this. Om is a shabda. Is this clear? So Om, when we say this, Mandukya uh, Bhupanishad commences with the statement. ओम इत्येतदक्षरमिदग्गनसलवन्तस्योपव्याख्यानं now this can be taken as the essence of various upanishads because these akshara's form the beginning words etc so this om as a shabda if you just take so this is found to have been extremely effective in making you appreciate the larger picture of this universe and your situation in that 
So when, uh, say, since you are familiar with our philosophy, as I can very easily see, Upanishads. So we find this description in various Upanishads in various space. If you take Chandogya Upanishad, it will say, Sadeva Somveda Magriya Sidekameva Dhidiyam. Okay. Now, if you take uh, other Upanishad, Atma Vaidame Kevagriya Sid. So, if you find some other Upanishad, Brahmai Veda Magriya Sid. Now, what you have to understand is this whether the Upanishad uses the word Sat or Atma or Brahma, they mean one and the same thing. Now, when another Upanishad says, Omityadakshara so this primordial entity which we are referring to by the word Atma, Brahma, etc., is also represented by the word Om. Okay? So we have scriptures which says, Omkaras, Chasas, Abdhista, Dvaveto, Brahmana, Pura, Kantham, Ritva, Vinilyato, Tasman, Mangalika, Uphavu. So Omkara as a Ucharana is something different from the descriptions of the word Om which we find as the primordial cause for this universe. Okay? So when I just say Om, I mean this is Om that you understand, I understand. So this cannot be, the Shabdocharana cannot be the cause of the universe. Okay? But this is taken to be representative if you take Ram or Murtinjai or Shishir. So this refers to the Sharira. It is a certain word. The word that has been employed to denote something, right? So the Samhya Samhya Bhava. This is what we have to understand. This Om as a Samhya for the primordial entity. So it is to be understood by the word Om. So what is to be understood? Where? I think we have to be clear. Thank you, sir. Murtinjai, you are not heard. Uh, sorry, sir. Yeah, I, I was just saying that there are a couple of more questions. Uh, before coming to that, I had a small point that I wanted to ask Shashiroji and uh, yourself, uh, Professor Ram Subramaniam. Um, so the idea being that of, um, you know, the whole idea of Lee Smolin, right? I mean, Professor Shashiroji must be familiar with his work lately. Um, and the idea being that in your RR and ER model, right, I have gone through your work, which you have, uh, you know, your book uh, as such, and there is an axiomatic element there, right, the rules that, you know, define the cellular network, the automata, essentially. So is it a question of going from one axiomatic premise to another, right? And in that sense, um, you know, something like a Tegmarkian idea, which, you know, there, there's a whole super set of mathematical structures and you just happen to have one, right? Does that make more sense or going with something which has an, a certain axiomatic premise and then building from that this pre-geometric pre notion, right? I mean, um, I, I would just like to know about your thoughts on that, yeah. <clears throat> uh, no, when... Uh... We are considering those type of RR model or AR model. Yeah. Then uh, it is the model which describes the substratum behind Planck scale. Right. Okay. So uh, initially we started to build up a model what is beyond space and time, beyond the usual space and time, what is called which is above the Planck scale. Okay. And then we tried to axiomatize it with whether. Uh, this can be axiomatized in a more comprehensive way. Right. Right. We tried to understand. Actually, we, uh, we we didn't give it. We wrote a kind of uh, mathematical structure, which is uh, which describes this subquantum wave. I mean, uh, just to kind of uh, change that question a little to uh, Professor Ramos Brunium, uh, do you think that it is the metadynamic perturbation more than the empirical perturbation? Right? When I say metadynamic, I mean the laws and the categories which are involved in these laws, essentially. Right? I mean, if I were to go by a purely mathematical or scientific uh, you know, framework. And uh, Max Tegmark has written about this, as I was mentioning. Um, so do you think that is a more interesting perturbative picture than, than the empirical one? And whether that is what is meant by causal and empirical kind of manifestations? Uh, <laughs> see, this is a little difficult. Um... So this perturbation, so this, I do not really understand the kind of perturbation that is being talked about 
at this level so we have invented a certain term to describe a certain phenomenon which is beyond our comprehension i am not trying to underestimate the efforts that are being put by scientists so it is in the nature of human being to try to find an alternative explanation which can give a much better picture of what we are trying to understand of the observed universe so this uh, when we uh, understand what is perturbation i mean they at a normal level of perception i mean this is very different from the kind of thing that we are trying to describe for instance even when we want to describe virus or whatever chaos when we use in physics i mean this has something to do with what we try to understand from a slightly different view point with a slightly uh, common uh, denominator of uh, understanding so which may be there so whether to call it uh, meta or to call it physical i don't know <laughs> yeah um so we'll just take two quick questions uh, after this and then we'll have jayanji giving us a little bit of uh, opening uh, closing statement um i still see subhash kak ji has not been able to join so we'll just go to the questions uh, dr k v purohit uh, had a question please go ahead yeah good evening to everyone uh, may i have uh, one query only Uh, that is that common people know about uh, uh, all the four uh, elements but akash tattva is an element which the common people don't know much about it so how to explain the importance of the akash tattva to the common pe- person yeah so dr purohit Say, let yeah. me just tell you. There are multiple ways in which we try to explain a particular concept depending upon the state in which the person is. So this we have to be very clear about. So anything that we explain, so if it is a common man, you try to explain it in a particular way. If it is a physicist, I mean, you try to explain it in a particular way, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. If your yeah. question is. with reference to common man so yeah. the way people have put it is simple so let me just <laughs> take this question to time also so hmm. suppose you ask me what is time so either shishir rai or me so we yeah. will be really, uh, unable to answer if you ask me yeah. what is time i will tell it is 7 11 pm rest now yeah. the time is different from time similarly akasha when we are discussing so we are trying to discuss something which has been discussed by philosophers and physicists regarding the deep questions of akasha so for a common man your uh, understanding of um, uh, pancha bhutas so four are seen by us this is what we mean yeah. so why you may yeah. not be seen but it is definitely yeah. sensed by you but other things you can physically see you can touch you can have various feelings so even when professor shishada was mentioning so shabda tanmatra i mean there's a five gunas will be there in one thing so three everything will be there akasha only shabda guna will be there this is a kind of a thing now there are two things which people have proposed in the indian philosophy rather than if you look at the philosophical literature one is as i was thinking during my talk avakasha pradatr akasha means that which gives space for a tangible entity to exist okay so this is what so suppose you take so you, you take a pot so this has more akasha okay i live in a much larger space when you say what does it mean the boundary is much larger right so that gives you more space to move around so this is what the common man's notion will be so that so you think of a certain entity now the simpler way of explaining time as they have done uh, is so that it is an abstract thing obviously that which lets you speak of past present and future is time you understand that which lets you speak of past present and future is time this is a simple way of make people appreciate similarly yeah. so what is space mean that which gives you uh, 
a space to accommodate something, to place something. So when uh, two people are sitting in a bus, there is only two seater. So what would you say? There is no space for the third person, right? Which hmm. means you cannot accommodate the third fellow to come and occupy that position. So Akasha is, I mean, conceived in that particular way for a common man. Hmm. No, uh, the the. Sorry, I think there seems to be. Yeah, Dr. Rohit, if you have any quick comments, otherwise we'll go on to the next, the last questioner. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, so we also have again we have uh, Dr. Sumit Kumar Mishra. If you could ask your question. Or questions yes, rather, please make it into one condensed question, if possible, one, one question as possible. Yes. Thank you, Mukundu, for giving me time. Uh, effect of Akash on other Mahabhutas in view of sustainability of environment. First question. And second, there are so many anthropogenic activities like uh, space debris and other artificial weather modification and uh, on in Akash Tattwa. So, what's the view of the imminent speakers? Two questions. Sorry, Professor Ramasubramanian, you are muted as well, uh, so we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, but then, should I repeat? No, no. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. You would like to? Okay. Yes. Please go ahead. No. no. Uh, if uh, our uh, speakers have heard me, then I think it's not needed for repetition. Yeah. No, no. Just tell what is it. I did not hear. Once again, if you could just hear. Yeah. Say effect of Akash Tattva on other Mahabhutas in view of sustainability of environment. It was first question. And second, the effect of anthropogenic activities like space debris or artificial weather modifications, which is going on in Akash Tattwa. So how do we visualize here? There no, are two I, set of questions. I don't think I, there is any connection. So the Akash Tattwa, <laughs> so just because uh, some space is associated with everything, I mean, everything exists in space, we cannot connect. Mr. Roy, if you have any comments? Uh, we don't know exactly okay. how it is related. Right, right, right. So I think um, um, we will conclude the session here. Um, I would firstly like to thank our speakers, our esteemed speakers. Unfortunately, Professor Subhash Kak is traveling in Miami, I, I believe, as he mentioned, and uh, there is some ne network problem that he had to face. Um, but I would like to thank uh, Professor K. Ramasubramaniam, uh, Professor Shishir Roy, and Professor uh, Rama Jayasundar for their insightful thoughts. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this has been a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I would also like uh, the audience here, if you have any further questions, to please contact um, um, you know, our, our speakers. Um, and we would look forward to taking this discussion forward um, in, in, in our activities under Mandala. So uh, thank you all. And we hope to see you in, the, in our next event. Thanks, <laughs>